one. And today we're going to look at uh, three very remarkable <coughs> young men who, uh, who trusted God to sustain them and to give them the sustenance, the nourishment that their body needed, even in this uh, wicked place called Babylon, uh, Babylonia. And today, as we prepare to partake of the spiritual meal of communion, we can reflect on the uh, issues and uh, teachings that this story of Daniel and his three friends bring to our mind. That being said, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of each and every one of our hearts will please God, who is our rock and our redeemer. So can God do it? Can he meet our needs? Can he really do that? You know, a lot of us give lip service to saying that, yeah, God can provide for us in Gladys' prayer. She said his hand is open generously to, to meet the needs of all living creatures. Do we meet it? Or are we just saying it because we know that's what we're supposed to say? Can God really meet our needs? Many of us can quote parts of Psalm 50, which says this. God is speaking. He says, Every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills are mine. I know every bird in the mountains, and the creatures of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine, and all that is in it. Do I eat the flesh of bulls, or drink the blood of goats? Sacrifice thank offerings to God. Fulfill your vows to the Most High, and call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you. And you will honor me. The cattle, the cattle on a thousand hills belong to God. I trust you've heard that before. He will deliver those in trouble when they call on him in the day of their need. We say these things, but do we believe it? Do we put our money where our mouth is? Or are we just big talkers? What evidence in your life would you offer? To prove to a jury that you trust in God to provide. What evidence would I offer? In Daniel 1, we have the story of four young men who truly did believe that God would provide. They were willing to put their lives on the line to prove it. Daniel 1 gives us this uh, theme. It opens up the theme of the book of Daniel. It's a twofold theme in Daniel chapter 1. It's God's providence. God's providence in the uh, running of nations, the events, national events, but also God's providence in individual lives. We see that Babylon has come and conquered Judah, the southern portion of Israel, the nation of God. But this is not out of God's control. In fact, this is what God's prophets talked about decades before it happened. They predicted it and said, this is God's judgment on us for abandoning his ways. God is in control of the events of nations. And Babylon was God's instrument of punishment upon Judah. But he's also over control, in control of the events of the lives of individuals. And that's what we see a real focus on when we look at the story of Daniel and his friends. So Judah has been conquered by Babylon. They've come in. They've taken the booty. They've taken the plunder. They grab these young men, snatch them up out of their homes. The Bible describes them as being of the royal line. They're aristocracy. They're educated. They're healthy. They're trained. And Babylon, the king of Babylon says, I need some people who will advise me in regards to how to deal with this nation and maybe even serve me as advisors in other capacities. Why not look to the best and brightest of this nation that I've just conquered and see what they have to teach me? It's a different culture, a different perspective. Maybe I could learn something from these guys. So he puts them in a three-year training uh, camp in which they are to learn his language, read his literature, become acquainted with their culture, and then he's going to test them to see are they worthy to stand in the king's court and give him counsel. Daniel and his friends are part of this group. 
And when they get to it, when they come to the training camp, they are slaves. They are captives. Taken from their home. They have no say in where they go or what they do. They are taken by force, uprooted, and planted in a new place. So here they are. They are told, you will do this. You will do it at this time. You will do what I say when I say it. What are they to do? So, they are entered into the training process. Very quickly, early on, they find out our Jewish names are not suitable to these people. I guess a good way to understand that would be to think about Chinese people coming to America and trying to pronounce their names. I have a good friend, Liu Yiping is her name. But if she were to introduce you to herself, or if I were to introduce you to her, I would introduce you to Martha, Liu. Why? Because Li Ping is a kind of strange name to our ears. And so in the same way, these, Daniel and his friends, receive new names. And there's not too much they can do about that. But when they sit down at the table, the table is spread before them. And what do they see in front of them? They see all sorts of lavish, fancy foods. It says that the foods that they ate came from the king's table itself. What sort of food comes from the king's table? The best, the richest. Wines, meats, cheeses. And I'm like, stop talking about that. I'm hungry already. <laughs> I think about places like, now for me, like Outback, uh, where you get your steak and it comes out and it's thick and it's juicy and it's fatty and it's greasy. This is the sort of food that I'm picturing. And of course, you've got to order blooming onion, right? Yes? One for me? <laughs> amen. One, I think that's the first amen I've gotten in probably a year. And, and it's because I said a blue onion. <laughs> God, he's fine tuning this bunch of people. <laughs> so you've got to order a blooming onion, one for me, one for Brian, and one for the rest of y'all. And of course, when you're done, Eating the, the greasy, heavy, witty foods, drinking the soda or the beer or whatever you order, you feel gross. Don't you? I do. At least, at least after about, about an hour and a half, I start to feel greasy myself. Well, this is what Daniel and his friends are experiencing. They have the richest, lavish fare that they have seen in their lives before them. But not only that, the food that is before them is the meat that has been sacrificed to the Babylonian gods. So, in the Jewish mind, this meat is defiled. This meat is unfit for Jews to eat. So, what does Daniel do? He says, I come to your country. I have no choice. I've taken your name. I understand you can't pronounce my name. You have trouble remembering that. But, and the Bible tells us that he's he's in good with his with the the, uh, the guard over him. They become friends. They're on good related terms. And he says to him, "But here, this goes against my faith. This goes against my God." Please, please, don't make me eat this food. Because if I do, I'm acting against my God. And while the guard sympathizes, he says, listen, I understand your plight, but you've got to understand mine now. These guys are being frank with each other. They're open with each other and honest. He says, you've got to understand mine. If you don't eat that food, and you eat these fruits and vegetables that you're talking about, and I present you to the king or even to my supervisor, and you guys are scrawny, sickly, unhealthy, or in some other way deficient, you could be my life on the line. I, I hear what you're saying, and I understand. I want to help, but what can I do? 
Daniel thinks, he says, well, I've got an idea.